I've had the chance of speaking with one and 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 learning a little bit about um, uh, the second mentor as well. And I'm really excited for this session. We're going to talk a little bit about leadership as well as company culture. And I have two really good mentors here to speak with you. I'm going to read their bios and then I'll bring each one up individually to speak for about three minutes. And then we'll open up for questions from the founders. Um, first, we have uh, Senator Michael D. Brown, who is currently serving his third uh, six, sixth year term as one of two non-elected non or non of two elected non-voting senators uh, for the District of Columbia. In his role as a shadow senator, Mr. Brown lobbies the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives on behalf of the citizens of Washington D.C. in their intent attempts to gain full representation in Congress. In 2008, Barack Obama said, even without a vote, Senator Brown has always been a strong advocate for the rights of DC residents. For more than 40 years, Senator Brown has consulted on and participated in national political campaigns, including seven Democratic presidential campaigns. He has started his own company, Horizon Communications Corporation, which provided direct mail services to nonprofits and political organizations, including the Democratic uh, uh, National Party. Uh, for more than 25 years. Also with us today, we have James Felton Keith, who is an award-winning engineer and economist turned labor leader and was the first black LGBTQ person to run for federal office in America via US Congress in, two, in 2017. He's the CEO at Inclusion Score Incorporated, companies that currently uh, companies and currently lectures on inclusion at the University of Georgia's Terry College of Business. As an entrepreneur, he established the first international diversity and inclusion certification standard and effectively reshaped commercial insurance to incentivize inclusion via a standardized inclusion score. Um, inclusion score is trusted by some of the world's largest enterprises like PwC and Lloyd's of London. Uh, and James is an LGBT advisory board member to the Democratic National Committee and is responsible for starting Pride Nights at America's four largest sports franchises, the NBA, NHL, MLB, and NFL. Really happy to have both of these uh, gentlemen with us today. I'll go ahead uh, and bring on uh, Senator Michael Brown first. Senator, if you'd like uh, to share your screen, I'm happy to do so. If not, no worries either, sir. Yeah, I think I'm on as far as I can see. Now you're dealing with an old man, so uh, maybe <laughs> I don't have it, but I can see you and I can see my picture up there. So then, yeah, I, I think we're all set. Okay, well, I'm good. and. And I don't know what more I can say about my background since you've given a pretty good synopsis of it. I would only add that in addition to that, I ran a large nonprofit group, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, and I also sit on the board of directors of a foundation which puts hundreds of thousands of dollars a year into local charities. So I have kind of a wealth of experience that all kind of revolves around politics. I started my business, as you said, Horizon Communications with an $800 loan from my sister and turned it into a business where I was a consulting firm where I was billing out more than a million dollars a year. And um, I was very successful at that. And I left it. And for the past 17 years, I've been the non-voting United States Senator for the District of Columbia, which I find very, very rewarding. Like I say, sit on the foundation. And so anything you want to know about politics, uh, I've been doing it for 40 years. I used to be a DNC staff member. So I'm glad to hear your your guest, your other guest sits on an advisory board over to DNC. And the DNC Democratic National Committee was my client for 25 years. I provided services to them and to other political groups in Washington. Um, I became kind of an accidental entrepreneur in that I left the public. I realized that public interest management wasn't really something I wanted. It wasn't a path I wanted to follow. And at 28 years old, I had the responsibility of running a rather large group. I mean, it was 40 employees in those days. And now I think it's up to like 120. But uh, I decided, you know, I wanted to take a different path and go back into politics. I'd gone into that after being in politics for four or five years at Democratic Committee. 
And uh, I started a consulting firm. People started to call me. They wanted my advice. They wanted me to help them with their problems. And uh, I learned what every one of my clients does. And I would say, you know, that's something you absolutely have to do. And it's, it's crazy that I was in business and so many of my competitors didn't know what my my clients did. I mean, they understood that they bought a particular service or a product, but they weren't exactly sure what they did with it. And I mean, this is what made my business explode was the fact that as a direct mail consultant, I bought part of a print shop because print shops do a lot of the work in direct mail, of course, in those days, they printed everything. But upon learning about my clients, I realized they did millions of dollars worth of printing in other areas besides direct mail. They had the Democratic National Committee had conventions and they had pamphlets that they put out and they had all sorts of things. So I learned how to do all that stuff. In fact, I had a friend that used to say your business should be called anything for a dollar because I learned how to fill all the gaps for them. And, you know, once you start doing stuff for people and you're good at it, they come back and they come back and they come back. And I'm proud, maybe the proudest accomplishment in my business is the first two clients that I started my business with were also clients when I ended my business. So I held them for 25 years. And, and that's not an easy thing to do, but it's really the key to success, I think, is to know what you're doing and let people understand that you're part of their team. You know, you're not a vendor. You're not somebody that just gets services from them. And if people in the nonprofit world, I know there are a lot of nonprofits here, want to ask me questions. I did run a pretty successful nonprofit, and I sit on the board of directors of a, of a, you know, a uh, not of a, a foundation which funds exclusively funds nonprofits. So I know the kind of things that we look for when we look to to fund, and that's I guess awesome. that's it. And you can ask me questions. No, fantastic, Michael. No, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Senator Brown. Um, uh, you know, we'll open up for questions in just a sec. I'm sure they're going to be, but um, you, you had a really good point. I know there's a lot of people on the call here that are doing B2B sales. Um, they're work, trying to work with some of the largest insurance firms, um, healthcare providers, et cetera. And I think you tapped on something, which is really finding out what they need and then figuring out how you right. can help them do that as well. So right. we'll open up for um, questions in just a sec. But before we do, um, I'd like to bring on James Felton Keith, uh, award-winning engineer and economist and, um, and also uh, the CEO of Inclusion Score. James, sure. how are you? Hey, everybody. I'm good. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. Uh, so nice to meet everybody. My name is James and Felton and Keith. I have a lot of first names and you can call me by any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of things over the course of the past uh, 20 years. I started as an engineer, a mechanical engineer. I had a, a bit of a, a plateau as a, a macroeconomist or labor economist. And Worked with a bunch of politicians before I ran for office uh, back in 2017, 18, and, and onward. And with regards to leadership and company culture, I've, I've started a lot of companies. I've run a lot of companies. I used to run a large arm of Hewlett Packard and some of their clients in the insurance industry out of uh, the EMEA area, like Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa. Uh, a few software companies where we delivered software. I had staff above 150 folks under this company. We delivered tech mostly to banks and insurance companies. And then I've also started a few um, software companies, which is what Inclusion Score is over the years. Tiny companies, companies from one employee ranging up to 50 employee. And probably the most daunting task was trying to build a, a campaign here in Harlem in northern Manhattan with more than 100 people in a matter of a few months, and not only being the product, right, but also being the CEO. And I think I'm not suggesting that everyone run for office of some sort tomorrow as a internal reflection exercise, but I think what I've learned with regards to leadership, I sort of hit leadership and corporate culture in, in three, three segments. 
is whether you're running a really tiny company or you want to scale, what we see in the research, at least the corporate ethnography, is that companies with less than 50 employees essentially echo the culture of the chief executive. So your company is who you are. I'm assuming you all as companies are at that level or smaller. But as you aspire to scale the size of your company, I think, you know, number one, as, a, as an individual, as arguably an outperformer, I think when I was coming up, we would hear about the 2080 rule, about 20% of employees doing 80% of the work. And I think there's a, there's a, a problematic um, value question that comes into play with high performers, especially when they meet people who aren't doing exactly what they're doing for the company and sort of misjudging their value, their contributions to the productivity of the company. And again, by productivity, I just mean a measure of inputs. All productivity is really just a measure of things that go into that, that end good, whether it's a product or a service, something you can touch or something you can't touch. And not not requiring the employees that work for you or that report into you to produce and be as passionate about the problem that you're solving as your pro as you are, I think is sort of the golden rule, giving people grace, trying to spend enough time to define the roles that they're performing is extremely important. But after you've done that operational piece, and let's say your, your entity is growing a bit, or at least you'd like it to grow a bit, I think trying to regulate your own ego is, is necessary. So in my business, we're inclusion score is an insurance underwriter. We work with the likes of Lloyd's and Chubb and, and Zurich and you name it. And what we do is we are the custodian, if you will, for the international ISO 30415 standard for diversity and inclusion. And the reason that matters is outside of myself and a, a large team in Geneva writing the standard over the course of the past decade, the insurance industry leverages this standard to understand the risk that companies take on for managing people or rather managing people poorly. So when you see people leave their employ employer disgruntled and they say, you know, you put my hair, you call me a name, it could be gender or race or ability or whatever based, right? If they do that under counsel, Instead of the normal, at least in this country, six weeks of severance that you get offered, let's say they get offered six months, that difference is an insurance policy. We pay that bill. And at Inclusion Score, we leverage that incentive to force companies of all sorts. We deal with about 500 companies at this point across 14 nations. And we are essentially pinpointing diversity and inclusion or poor people management as a price relative to their insurance premiums. And one thing that we try to advise most executives at most companies is to leverage the standard to build out enough internal operational infrastructure to regulate their own zeal or their own ego. And I think even if you're operating in a much smaller company and you're looking for opportunities to let your employees know that number one, you trust them, and number two, you want their feedback, I think you should spend time building internal advisory board infrastructure like employee resource groups, even if you run a, a small company, to receive feedback from what people believe you are and are not doing well. Not every entrepreneur is a great operator, but every entrepreneur is necessary to get a company to the next level. And so some of the biggest flaws that I've seen from startups going into scale-ups is leaders' inability to really effectively navigate building out a company culture where people want to work there, regardless of what kind of product or service you deliver. And so I think outside of the individual uh, spending time exploring themselves and, and answering the question about why they're doing what they're doing, transferring that why onto your employee body and asking them to do the noble work of producing your product and service is absolutely necessary. But I think the the most dynamic thing you can do is trying to find unique ways to operationalize trust with them so they can both give you feedback and you can leverage that to be their guide in trying to scale the company's productivity. Productivity always, you know, it manifests itself in, in capital. And so uh, that's just, you know, I'll, I'll sum it up there, but that's sort of my experience with leadership and, and building 
corporate culture or company culture. I think that um, the new brand of leadership really requires that not only executives, but managers are capable of listening, taking in feedback, and still guiding their teams forward, not just project managing the execution of, you know, whatever the task at hand is. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of attention should be paid to that if you plan on scaling. And I think it also plays into how you engage investors and, and are able to speak about scalability. At some point, investors, and I heard or overheard some of the, the previous panel, um, some of them are looking for employee feedback about the company's ability to really sustain itself. The last thing I'll say, the third and last thing I'll say about leadership is I think that that personal brand really matters, right? And so in introducing, for instance, the type of product that I'm introducing, which is really a technical product, an engineering product, I think leaning on my engineering chops matter. But the, the innovation, if you will, a word that I kind of loathe a bit, <laughs> that we pulled off was really more of a political feat. We were able to leverage my personal story and brand to pull in a lot of partners like these large insurance carriers to invest in our ability to scale a company. And what they were really investing in was the fact that I had too much skin in the game to be a hypocrite because I am a relative public figure. And, and I talk a lot and have written and spoke a lot about inclusion in general. And so as we do that, I think investors are also looking at your ability to practice what you preach and lead a team forward. And so as you think about leadership and company culture, I would definitely think about why you're doing it, how you can communicate that, number one. Number two, how you operationalize and incentivize feedback that should at least instill good trust in the people who are working for you, regardless of how grand or how minor you think that their role is. And last but not least, really trying to figure out what your niche is and how you can invest in that personal brand and that that brand story. Uh, and, and by brand, I mean the brand rooted in your name. I don't think most people can remember my name, for instance, but most people that I don't know just call me JFK. Uh, and as they do, they're mainly thinking about the type of skin that I might have in a game and my ability to deliver as opposed to run away from the mission that I agreed on with uh, whoever the investment community is that I'm trying to entertain. So <clears throat> I just, I'll leave you with that, but I'm, I'm available for, for any questions, any, any at all. Thanks. All right, James, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Senator Brown as, as well. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll hop right into questions and I see Joy's hand right up. So please, Joy, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Let me put myself on the screen here. So hello, uh, I'm Joy Chevalier and I am the founder and uh, president of the Cook's Nook here in Austin, Texas. And we create culturally relevant and medical, medically tailored meals that are the core of targeted nutrition solutions that are driving engagement and enrollment uh, and lead to improved health outcomes that drive the cost of care and, and improve the returns on investment to our contract holders. And uh, I really like what you said uh, regarding uh, you know yourself and yourself as the center of that brand and that and that brand story, um, and I was just sort of curious um, as you bring those people around you, um, you know, um, any board of advisors or any uh, board of directors are a reflection certainly on you and, and what you what you hope the company to be. The question is, what is what do you think is their response? We talked a lot about what we do and what we have to extend out. What do you think uh, that reflection back, what is its responsibility, whether it's board of directors or board advisors, what is its responsibility back to you and the company as far as leadership is concerned? Sure, I think that's a great question. Oh, I'm assuming you're... You, sorry, yes, I'm, yes, yeah, yes. No, I, James, I, no, I that's talk great. too much, so y'all might have to cut me out. Yeah, um, no, I think... from. For me in particular, my board of board of directors or board of advisors are, are two different groups. The advisors I collect to do a specific thing. They usually have an industry specific task. Mm -hmm. And just what I ask them is that they owe me and the people that they think are receiving this, this service or product that we're delivering. Um, they owe them enough time to try and distribute that product or process. So everyone on my board is really 
a mechanism of distribution. I don't have any mm -hmm. just blanket, you know, investors who are not also tied to distribution yep. on mm -hmm. on my board. But again, I'm, I try to make it a social mission. You know, just like running a campaign, I'm building I'm building a church or a mosque, a temple of some sort, and trying to lead those folks. It is slightly political. Is it is slightly social, right? And I think asking that of them, it gives them a sort of uh, moral obligation, if you will, to, to participate. But I, I don't think that that's beyond the pale from a from a business standpoint, especially if you know. I like to talk about inclusion and capitalism as a as a as a faith. I, I think it is. Uh, but as I do that, I'm normally asking folks to to participate and give me, you know, 100 percent be present when they are here to do the unique thing that they do. So, for instance, we have some people on our board who are just specific to the European underwriting market. Some people mm -hmm. are just specific to the broking market and some people who are just specific to to DNI. So mm -hmm. all of the lead conveners in Geneva at the International Organization for Standards who wrote this particular standard, they make up the original board. Mm -hmm. well, my only ask for them is I was just saying, you know, I'm a better entrepreneur than you. I'll take this to the moon, but I need you to validate what we're doing. So when we call on you to give a talk or enter a class or, you know, help mm -hmm. us sell out a product, I need you on if you want your work to matter. Because most people don't know what an ISO standard is or how it exists. You have to bake it in to corporate world. And so I think it's about making the ask and making it somewhat um, somewhat, somewhat moral uh, to them in whatever your business is. And I, mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about, I've heard you give your spill at least twice. And I like how you're on message every time. And so, yeah, everyone is dealing with you, especially if you're dealing with healthcare insurance providers, make them understand that the ability for you to distribute your product is, is literally saving lives, it's preemptive. And if they can't help you do this, they don't actually give a damn about what they're saying they're working on. Like charge them up, you know, mm -hmm. put on that black robe, and be pious, you know, practice what you preach, you know, so. But, That's but, so funny. I, yeah. I'll just tell you just real quick, JFK and, and, and Michael, whom I, I, I know, I actually was the 2018 candidate for comptroller for the state of Texas. And, <laughs> and one of the things I've avoided doing actually was thinking of um, tying myself that much to the message in the company, right? You do that as certainly in a campaign, you are telling your story, they are trying to get you know, it's your value set that you're putting in front of voters that you're trying to get resonating in line with them. But in the company, I've always tried to pull myself and make myself a little bit more invisible in the company story, right? The company yes. story and mission is more important than than me. And I keep yes. getting I keep getting corrected on this. Yeah, <laughs> it takes a lot. I used to do that I, when I was in my 20s. I, I moved to New York to start a fintech company, and we had this young genius MIT kid. He looked odd. And, my objective was to be a COO and humble myself to produce the message. And I just realized later, folks were like, no, you, you got your own thing that you have to do. And every time you try to make it just about the company, people want to know why. And as an operator, I think we can often go, it's a silly, let's talk about the business at hand. But humans buy humans, and they want to mm -hmm. know your story more than anything else. And it is, I'm with you, it's been annoying to me at times. <laughs> Because I'm like, I don't want to talk to you, right? I, when I go into places, I'm like, we're talking about DNI. This is not a safe space. So I might curse you out. Stay out of my face, right? <laughs> but at the same time, people want to know you. And that's ultimately what they're going to buy, especially at early stage. Even when we talk about investors, they're buying you. You know, even, even if it's rooted in sexism, racism, et cetera. I've had a kid at a VC ask me, I was wearing a T-shirt. He's like, what do you look like in a board meeting? I had to Google myself to show them who I am in a blue suit and a red tie. Mm -hmm. I, but then I cursed them out. I told them if I ever see you in Boston, I'm going to whoop your ass. And I mean it. I'm slightly violent. <laughs> That's how politics really works. So You so, wake, wake up and choose violence, actually. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> hey, James, thank you so much for that as well. I, I want to be really conscious of time. We have a couple other founders in. Um, I see Kwame's hand raised, but I see also, Susan, you had a, um, um, a, a question here in the chat. Would you like to ask it first real quick? I, I think yours came first. 
I'll be fast. I want to leave room for Kwame, but um, just, you know, the recent Supreme Court decision and you see so many black women leaving um, the space, uh, angered at their companies, how they're treated, not being able to move things forward. What are you seeing um, now? How, how worried are you about this decision and how should we be thinking about all of this? So I'm assuming that's a question for me because yeah. yeah, I just say, number one, the Supreme Court decision is as an activation for more work. I've actually got an op-ed coming out Friday in the Insurance Journal about this exact topic. There are a few phenomena that we can't avoid, no matter what the Supreme Court says, right? So two things about the courts. The courts don't actually have the ability to enforce what they do. I mean, they have the ability to hold you in contempt of court and bring you in in that way. But regulators, um, you know, uh, policing bodies like the EEOC and the NLRB, et cetera, they're enforcing regs. Let's say, for instance, for the Supreme Court decision about affirmative action or the right to discriminate against LGBT people, let's say it moves beyond that. Let's say it goes like the right to discriminate against, say, disabled people. Let's say you run a company, you run a bakery, and you don't want to put, you build a new facility, and you don't round the curbs on your new building. That's against the Americans with Disabilities Act. You will get fined for that until your company doesn't exist anymore. That's number one. Number two, there are a few different economic phenomena at play here. I'll say this though about the lawsuits. The reason I work in insurance, the reason insur inclusion score is an insurance company, not a DEI consultancy, even though we aggregate and deploy about 1,500 DEI consulting companies, is because there's $10 billion of lawsuits globally, about $5 billion in this country alone annually, in what we call retaliation or discrimination. The EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the policing organization for discrimination and retaliation, they reported a 20% spike in grievances in 2022 alone, right? It's normally about 5 to 6% spike. That number is being paid out by the insurance industry. The reason we're in insurance is because it is too expensive for companies to operate as they did in the 20th century. And there are really two things at play that make them too expensive. It's not just the lawsuits. The first reason is that the S&P 500 claim, all of them collectively, claim that 90% of their balance sheets are what we will call intangible assets. Intangible asset, if you're not familiar, is just code for people. Like if I am Standard & Poor's and I hire a woman from Yale to be my chief U.S. economist, I take out what used to be called a strongman policy on her head. We just call it a director's and officer's policy now for 20 million bucks, makes my valuation at least $20 million. I can't claim to my bank and my insurer, Zurich, Chubb, Liberty, that my balance sheet is all intangible assets. Meanwhile, I'm an uptick at 20% of those people suing me. That's number one. Number two is me, Beyonce, and Britney Spears are arguably the oldest millennials on the planet. And for our whole lives, 40 plus years, women have been going to college and graduating at a higher rate than people like me. When I went to Tuskegee, when I went to Harvard, when, when I got out of school, it was an eight to one ratio women to man when I, women to, to, to man when I got there. Now, 40 years later, the debate is we all work with women or work for women. And if we don't, there, there should be a more lively debate about why she didn't get her promotion and, and who we work for. I don't care whether you're liberal or conservative or whatever, there's women everywhere. We talked to the insurance commissioner in Mississippi because his chief of staff is a woman and she wanted to implement the ISO standard. So whether you're in Mississippi or Milan or Marseille in the south of France, you're using this standard to underwrite risk because 51% of the national and global population is has ovaries and they want their money. And that won't slow down until we have adequate risk management in place to ensure that companies are deploying inclusivity just as they do accounting, engineering, cybersecurity, and every other type of corporate operations. So the Supreme Court ruling did nothing but empower Joe Biden's argument. And as you can see, there's a lawsuit against Harvard and how they play into legacy students right now. Harvard's going to pay an uh, insurance claim for both lawsuits, both the one against affirmative action and this one against their legacy admissions. And the insurance industry is going to have to pay both bills. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about racism or reverse racism, retaliation or other, the insurance industry has a bill to pay and we don't want to pay it.
So we're getting ready to bully everybody over the next eight years to do what we say. I don't normally sell people our product, I insist. So I'm optimistic about the future and, uh, and I hope that you all are too, as long as you keep showing up and you know, showing us how, how unladylike, and that's a bad word, you might wanna be, the world will be a better place. So that's my take on the, the Supreme Court. And I'll, I'll be sure to send uh, send uh, Jim and the, the team the op-eds if, if you all like to see them as they come out over the course of the next week. Yeah. Thanks so much, James. Appreciate it. Um, we have time for a 30 second question uh, for uh, either Senator Brown or James Kwame. Please go ahead. We have about 30 seconds and I got to cut it off. Sure. Yeah. Th thanks for um, letting me ask you again. So real quick, and I think that this is uh, maybe relevant to all the founders. All of us are mission-driven companies. Um, for example, my company is uh, focused primarily on the Black community. I've gotten a lot of pressure to expand that, to you know, kind of make it for everybody. And anybody can use the platform. It's not like it's exclusive, uh, exclusionary in that sense. But how do I you know, take that into consideration, you know, take advantage of that market opportunity that exists outside the Black community, and maintain the mission, right? And, and how do I navigate that conversation as I'm promoting the company? Because we've kind of built a brand currently around focusing on the black community and we just want to kind of hear y'all's thoughts, but either either one of you. Well, you, you know, if I could add something for that question, I think you have to be, and James has already pointed this out, true to yourself. And I think you have to do what I said. You have to find out what the interests of the community that you want to be involved with are and find ways to plug your company into that interest. And I, I guarantee you, you'll be able to find ways to do that if you understand what they're doing and what they need. And that's the thing you have to show them. And I think James would agree that, with this, given what he said, that you have to show them that they need you, not more than trying to sell them. You need to show them that you have something to offer them as their partners. I think that's important. I agree. I think you, I think it's, it's, it's important to differentiate from whatever's already in the market, but I think the most grand model I think that we've seen of that is the, the founder at Bumble, the dating app. And, you know, I, I play around with a lot of apps. I'm not on Bumble, but uh, not that there'd be anything wrong with being on Bumble, but if folks aren't familiar with it, it really, I think, is designed like every other dating app. We look at in the fintech and insurtech world data apps to see how to make things addictive, which is ethically troubling. But this particular app is centered in women, right? And so if you're offering a service that a lot of people can benefit from, but it is centered in your focused community, I think that's a way to differentiate and scale. And maybe you do that through content and marketing around what your brand is, but you're still saying, hey, if other folks can benefit from this, come on in. We want to show you how we do what we do. Uh, but yeah, I think Bumble is about a $2 billion company. They're the only dating app that did not allow themselves to be acquired by Match. If you're all not familiar, Match.com is a publicly traded company that owns the majority of the other dating apps, and they blend the data together. But I think Bumble avoided that by differentiating and suggesting, at least, that their app was centered in, in women and their ability to, to pick and choose who they are. And so I think you can do something similar there, but uh, the senator is right. You got to stay true to yourself and, and tell those investors, even if they're used to a particular thing, you're really focused on your market. You know, the, the hard part in anything with entrepreneurship, though, is you got to back it up with the numbers. Um, so, awesome. yep. Awesome, Kwame. Well, thank you so much, sir, uh, for, for your question as well. Um, I, I really hate to cut it off. It's been a, a really interesting session, but I want to thank both of our mentors, James Felton Keith, um, who is the CEO of Inclusion Score um, and also a former candidate for, for Congress and, and lectures at the University of Georgia's Terry College of Business. Thank you so much, uh, James, for being here, as well as uh, Senator Michael D. Brown, uh, set shadow senator from Washington, D.C. Thank you both for your insights. If you'd like to share any of your contact information, please feel free to do so. But we'd really love to have you back, too. And again, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys.